Good evening. How are you doing tonight? I'm I'm waiting just a few minutes to start so that every the attendees can all be let in and we can get going. But welcome to the webinar tonight. And just give us two minutes and we will start promptly. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, I want to go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Yvonne Brandon. I'm with uh, Public Schools First NC. I'm the chair of the board uh, that governs Public Schools First NC. Tonight, our presenter is Lynn Edmonds. She is the outreach director for Public Schools First NC and for Great Schools in Wake. And uh, she's given this presentation several times, so she's a pro at it. So, you know, you can take some notes if you want to, but we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, we invite you to use the um, rate, you know, ask questions. Uh, we've built in at three places in our presentation tonight, uh, two in the, uh, for Lynn's presentation and one at the end where you can ask some questions. So be sure to be, you know, hold your questions and enter them at the question time. And uh, we hope that uh, we can get this presentation done quickly enough to allow you, the audience, some time to get your questions answered. So, Lynn, I think that with that, if you're okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm all set. Okay. Um, we hope tonight, if those of you are not familiar with Leandro, we hope that this will be sort of a Leandro 101, and we are going to discuss a lot about what's known as the West Ed Report, and I will define that for you and walk you through that later as well. We are going to start, however, with what is Leandro. It is a lawsuit that was filed in 1994. It has been a minute. Um, but so why has it taken so long? Why is it still ongoing, et cetera? We're going to walk you through that. But it was filed in 1994 by parents, students, and school districts in five of North Carolina's low wealth rural counties. And those are Cumberland, Polk, Halifax, Robeson, and Vance. And the plaintiffs argued in this, in this court case that North Carolina is in violation of our state constitution by not providing an adequate or equitable funds for students to receive a sound basic education, especially students in low wealth uh, communities and students of color. So what does our constitution say? It says very plainly that the state must provide a sound basic education for all children. Not all states have this written into their constitution. North Carolina is one of the few that does, and that is the basis of this lawsuit. So let's take a minute and talk about the history of this case. Again, why in the world, it was, if it was filed in 1994, why are we still talking about it? So let's, let's walk through the history of it a little bit. It was filed in 1994 and the state tried to have the case dismissed. That was one of the first things that happened. It went all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court and in 1997, the Supreme Court of North Carolina allowed it to move forward. So that took three years from 94 to 97 to even have it go to trial. It goes to trial and in 2002, the ruling is that the state is in violation of the state constitution and the state protests or they appeal. And that decision, and um, it goes back to the Supreme Court again. In 2004, the Supreme Court rules against the state a second time and upholds what the lower court had said. So that's 10 years right there from 1994 to 2004. And we want to we want to appreciate the gravity of this situation. Just think, there's there's many many students that have lost out because this has taken so long. But just if you if you just look from 1994 when it was filed to 2004 when the the North Carolina Supreme Court made that second ruling, that's 10 years. And the students that were in school during that time 
uh, did not receive the funds that they deserve. So in 2004, when the North Carolina Supreme Court made that ruling, the case was turned over to Judge Howard Manning. And between 2004 and 2016, Judge Manning hold, held numerous hearings um, and he did issue some rulings. For example, he ordered the State Board of Education to take over Halifax County Schools, but he never told the legislature specifically to invest more money in education. And we're gonna talk about why he didn't do that in a couple more slides. So in 2017, Judge Manning retired and the case was handed over to a new judge. His name is David Lee. And when this happened, when Judge Manning retired, the state tried again to have this case dismissed. They say that too much time has passed, it's not worth pursuing, there's no need for it, and they try to have it dismissed. But this time, it is within Judge Lee's purview to make that decision, and he declines. He does not allow this case to be dismissed. So he, that, that brings us um, to 2017. Between 2017 and 2018, the plaintiffs and the state, um, they asked for an independent agency to review the case and to make recommendations for how the state can be in compliance with our constitution. Judge Lee appoints West Ed to do that research, to do that report, and who, who is West Ed? So WestEd is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research group focused on public education. They're based in California, and this is the type of work they do across the United States for school districts across the United States. And in June of 2019, they gave their report to Judge Lee, and then it was released to the public in December of 2019. So what happened last year? So the report is, again, is released to the public in December of 2019. In January of 2020, Judge Lee told the State Board of Education and the legislature to submit action plans based on the recommendations that were in the West Ed report. He gave them 60 days to submit those plans. And if you do that math, you will, you know, quickly figure out that that is about when COVID hit and everything shut down. Um, so there was an extension and the deadline was extended. In June of 2020, the governor and the State Board of Education gave issued action plans to the judge, but there was nothing from the legislature. And that gets us to September of 2020. So on September 1st, 2020, Judge Lee held a very brief hearing. That hearing only lasted about 30 minutes. And in that 30 minute hearing, he signed a consent order, ordering the state to invest 426.9 million more dollars into education funding. This is additional money, and it was meant to be allotted this year, 2020-2021. Um, it is meant to be the first step of an eight-year action plan. The very next day on September 2nd, 2020, the legislature convened to appropriate CARES Act money. So they were, they were addressing COVID relief, which is perfectly appropriate considering the pandemic. But there was absolutely no discussion or debate about Leandro or about the ruling that Judge Lee had issued 24 hours before they were in session on September 2nd and September 3rd. They never discussed it, it didn't come up, and they adjourned until the long session, which is taking place now uh, this month in 2021. So that brings us to where we are today. We're January 2021, and Yvonne, I know you attended a meeting this morning um, on Zoom. Um, and if you want to tell us, so where, where are we today? What is the latest and what's next as far as we know? Well, the only thing that uh, we were all waiting so uh, for a report to come out, a plan to be shared in December before the holidays, and it didn't happen. What we've learned today is that now this uh, report back to, to uh, David Lee, Judge Lee, is not going to be... Uh, has been delayed until the middle of February, perhaps even the end of February. 
Uh, there was no reason given for why it was delayed. It, we were told that the everybody agreed to the delay, so that makes me think that the judge agreed with the plaintiffs and with the defendants that they needed more time uh, uh, to address the issues. And you know, Lynn, I'm suspect that having the fact that the General Assembly did nothing in the in the uh, fall and that the new long session starts. Uh, uh, in a few weeks, I think that that might have had something to do with it, that they wanted some time to confer with legislative leaders um, and so forth. But we don't really know, but we're hoping that now, uh, stay tuned and come back and check in with us because we hope that sometime around the middle of February, we'll have more information. Um, so I wanna go back to something that um, I said about Judge Manning. Um, I mentioned a few slides ago that he never ordered the General Assembly to invest more money. And so here's the big question. Um, and, it's, and it's an appropriate question. We should ask this question. Can a judge order the North Carolina General Assembly to invest more in our schools? Um, unlike Judge Lee, uh, Judge Manning never told the legislature to do that. The rulings that he made were, were related to other things, related to other, to other actions. When he has been asked, Judge Manning, when you've asked him, when people have asked him, why didn't you order the legislature to invest more money? He says that he does not have the constitutional authority to do that. Judge David Lee did exactly that. That was exactly his order, was ordering the state to invest more money. So clearly there is some disagreement there. Um, and and I, 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 we don't have an answer for you. What we can say to you is that clearly, even among legal scholars, even among attorneys, even among um, judges, there is a disagreement about whether or not they can order the General Assembly to actually do this, to actually um, take this action and invest more money. A couple of things. So first of all, let's always keep in mind that the North Carolina Supreme Court has twice upheld this lawsuit. They have not, it has tried to be dismissed and they have not dismissed it. Another thing, we have um, two examples and I apologize, I don't have the states at my fingertips, but um, similar cases have been brought up in other states. One state, uh, the, the um, the ruling from the judge was they fined the General Assembly $100,000 per day until they took action. So, um, you know, they if they couldn't compel the legislature to do it just by an order, they started fining the legislature $100,000 per day until they took action and invested more money. Another example that we have is that um, another court in another state threatened to shut down the schools, the public schools, unless the legislature complied uh, with the order. So there are other examples in other parts of the country where the judge can compel the legislature to take action. Uh, but so far in North Carolina, we've, we've been sort of stuck and hopefully 2021 will be different. Yvonne, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, Lynn, I will just say quickly that, uh, thank you, um, that this may end up being a tested case in North Carolina before it's all over. I do appreciate very much that Judge Lee, when he sent his order out, he wanted the General Assembly to work with the governor's office to develop a plan. I think that shows an interest in the judge's part in saying there may be some room for mediation or negotiations, uh, uh, but we need to move this forward. I'm, I'm compelling you both organizations, the governor and the legislative leaders to do this. So this is uh, on one hand, very encouraging. On the other, um, it, since the governor is willing to fund Leandro and has actually created his own work group around Leandro and has been working cooperatively with the judge, um, we're hopeful that the legislation this year will reflect that. Uh, but it is so it is truly in the legislators hands right now. And um, if they do not comply with the judge, it might be some really interesting times in North Carolina this spring. It is. And, let, and let's remember your point about the governor. Um, it is the governor and the state board of education. They complied with that order back in 2020 where the deadline was 60 days and then it got extended until June because of the pandemic. 
in June, the reports that were received by Judge Lee came from the governor and came from the State Board of Education, not nothing from the legislature. Right. Um, so before we move forward, I, I want to give our audience, I want to give you just an overview of state, um, excuse me, uh, school funding in North Carolina. It's important that we understand how this works. You see on your screen that um, most of our education funding does indeed come from the state. And when we say the state, we really mean the North Carolina General Assembly. The governor cannot act on his or her own to fund schools in our state. So most of it, 66% comes from the state, about 24% comes from local governments, that's going to be your county commissioners, um, your board of commissioners, et cetera, and your local tax dollars. Only about 10% comes from the federal government. So it's important that we have this, this understanding as we talk about a lawsuit that really is based on uh, public education funding. And, and then if I could add a quick point here, one of the things I want us to also remember, so you look at that 24%, but that 24% also indicates is inequity. Because what Wake County can afford to add into the local pot versus what Halifax County or Robeson County or Ash County can contribute is different. And that actually was how this these inequities is what brought forth this lawsuit to begin with. That where you Absolutely. live, where your zip code is, where you yep. actually live should not compel um, the decisions around if you can um, afford a sound basic education. Um, Lynn and I are like all of you watching tonight. We all live in a school district and we all like to advocate for our local school district and we want the best we can for our children. But we, put that beneath the goal of having a sound basic education for every child. And we lament that the, the inequities we see just in our county versus our neighboring counties. So I just wanted to add that, Lynn, thanks for- No, that's very, no, you, that's very true. And I'm actually gonna talk about that in some of the slides when we talk about the eight recommendations, the eight critical needs outlined in the Westhead report. So the other thing that I want our audience to be crystal clear on is that North Carolina's corporate tax rate has been slashed dramatically. Lawmakers have cut our corporate tax rate every budget cycle since 2013, and we now have the lowest corporate tax rate in the country. Some estimate that this costs our state about $3.6 billion per year, per year. Um, and if you note here, our neighbors to the north and the south of us in Virginia and South Carolina, their corporate tax rate is at 5%. And North Carolina's was at 6.9%. This has been slashed and cut. Um, it's not that it, it you know, grew at 2.5. Um, it, it was at 6.9. Uh, being the lowest in the country is not something in our view to be proud of. It really limits our ability to invest in public services, and that certainly includes public education. So this is another very important point to understand is that we have the absolute lowest corporate tax rate in the United States. So this is our first opportunity to just take a deep breath and make sure that there, if there's any questions in the audience, we wanna uh, stop for a second and give you a chance to ask those questions. Um, I'm looking here in the question box. I don't really see anything, but let's give everybody a second or two. If you have a question about the information that Lynn's presented so far, um, here's a here's a moment for you to do that. The thing that I will say about this corporate rate that Lynn mentioned is that you could probably easily understand that there's a direct correlation between the tax revenue that a state brings in and their ranking in terms of some of the key indicators of the things they fund. So North Carolina's teacher pay and per pupil expenditures have always been at some of the lowest in the South and in the, in, in the nation. And even when we've risen up a little bit better in the South, in the Southern states, nationally, we're well below what teachers are paid and well below what people are spending on each child for public education. And so, yes, that's directly related to uh, a reduction in revenue that we have created 
by slashing this from 6.9, not to 5%, but down to 2.5. 2.5 and again we are an outlier like that's um if you go back to that slide we are the the absolute lowest in the united states so we didn't just reduce it we we have slashed it to the bottom um and again even our neighbors to the north and the south of us um have not taken such drastic uh measures um, okay. And again, this is this is how we invest in our public services. So we we see it as a negative, um, and, and you know, I, I don't. I certainly understand that may you know not everyone may see it that way, but that is certainly how we view it. So we're going to take a look at the West Ed report. This is the report that Judge Lee um, solicited, and um, I want to walk you through what's in this report. This is what. Uh, the State Board of Ed and the governor and the legislature, hopefully, this is like their roadmap to how we're going to solve and um, fund Leandro. So West Ed identifies eight critical needs, um, and that's what you see on your screen. I am not going to read all eight of these to you because we're going to go through them one by one within our within our time allotment. Before I start going through these, I do want to encourage you to look for the West Ed report on the internet. We have it um, linked on our website. It is, if, if this is a topic that interests you or if you want to take a deeper dive um, after tonight, after anything that I, that I report to you, it is, it is very accessible. Um, I really, I, I have this report tabbed. Um, it's 300 pages, it's a large document, but it is very accessible to the general public. It's broken into sections, it's well written. So I encourage you to find it on our website and take a deeper dive if you're interested. So critical need number one is related to finance and resources. West Ed makes three recommendations here um, to prioritize higher needs students and provide flexibility to local school districts on how they spend state dollars. Over the last seven years, much of that flexibility has been taken away, and that makes it harder for local school districts to fund their specific needs. Second, West Ed says to ensure stability in state funding, and third, to identify some small, high-impact investments. Now, what do they mean by small, high-impact investments? They identify things like increasing pre-K, excuse me, pay, for pre-K staff, improving the teacher pipeline, and then whole child supports like more counselors and social workers. Related to critical need one, um, funding and resources, we need to remember the slashing of that corporate tax rate and understand that North Carolina is now 49th in the United States in what's called state funding effort. And that means how much a state spends on public education relative to their GDP or their gross domestic product. North Carolina ranks 49th. We are 46th in per pupil spending, and that ranking has really remained flat for more than 10 years. Um, some people will point out to you that the state's education budget is the largest piece of the whole state budget, and that is true. Um, we spend more than $10 billion on public education in North Carolina, and some people also say that that is the most that we have ever invested in the history of our state. That's also true. But when you dig deeper into the budget and into specific categories, you find that we are investing less on things like textbooks, professional development, and more. Um, and that's a whole other pre presentation in and of itself. Critical need number two in the West Ed report calls for a well-qualified and well-prepared teacher in every classroom. They make nine recommendations in this category related to building um, our teacher pipeline, growing our teaching fellows program, developing teacher residency programs, developing grow your own programs, Hiring teachers of color. And here's the rest of the nine. Um, mentoring and support for new teachers, developing advanced teacher roles, improving and growing professional development opportunities, and increasing teacher pay. 
especially enabling low wealth districts to compete in teacher recruitment. So what do we, I wanna break down, like there's, again, there's nine recommendations. I wanna talk about two of those. Um, with regards to our teacher pipeline, enrollment in our UNC system for kids going into college and to our schools of education, our enrollment is down more than 30% since 2011. And many bad policy decisions at the state level have, contri have contributed to that. Uh, the loss of master's degree pay, loss of retirement health benefits starting this month, uh, beginning January 2021. So right now, any new teacher coming into North Carolina, they will not receive retirement health care benefits, um, which is just a, a historic loss. Um, loss of longevity pay and loss of due process rights and more. Our teaching fellows program, it was abolished altogether in 2011. It was completely um, eliminated. Six years later in 2017, state lawmakers created a new version and we call it Teaching Fellows Light. And the reason we call it that is because it is a fraction of the program that it once was. Uh, the program, the original program gave out about 500 scholarships to 17 different universities. And uh, this new version gives less than half of that um, number of scholarships to only about five schools. And remember, one of those recommendations was to attract uh, teachers of color to um, increase diversity in our teacher pool. Well, uh, this new version has no HBCUs, which, is our, which are our historically black colleges. So that is not going to help us attract a diverse teacher pool. And then I'll add one point here. There was a, a legislation last year to add an HBCU school to add one. Adding one HBCU school is not enough um, to really make a difference in what you're showing us. And now, Yvonne, course, I don't want to fact check you on the spot, but we, we talked about this about a month or so ago. Did we not find that that didn't pass? Am no, I misremembering? It passed, um, okay. but it never got enacted because what it, they said was um, that, that they, if, if they, they could meet certain qualifications, and so supposedly um, one of the legislators who is not there now said that he was going to be working with uh, some of the HBCU schools to see if they would qualify to participate in the program. And evidently uh, they looked at uh, the uh, North Carolina a and in, Greens in uh, Greensboro, but nothing's come of it. I mean, they did make the recommendation they, you know, to extend this opportunity if they meet a whole bunch of criteria. So it's allowable, but one, it hasn't happened. And two, one, adding one school um, is not gonna, gonna be, um, an, allow enough opportunity to make move this needle. And as you said, uh, the fact that they're offering so, such a smaller amount of scholarships to teachers um, we're just not getting enough people in the pipeline fast enough. There's just no way. No, right, yeah. Critical need number three, West Ed says that we need a well-qualified, well-prepared principal in every school. And they make four recommendations in this category. Those are update principal prep and licensure requirements expand access to high quality principal preparation programs, expand professional development for principals and assistant principals, and revise the salary structures and improve working conditions. So under critical need three, um, we wanna review our principal pay scale um, and, and focus on recommendation number four from the previous slide about revising the salary structure and improving working conditions. When um, What you need to know is that we rank somewhere near the bottom in principal pay. We say about 50th here. Um, the reason for that, in 2017, North Carolina did rank 50th, the very bottom in the U.S. in principal pay. Uh, the legislature did make some adjust adjustments to the, to the pay scale, but we have been unable to find the latest ranking. 
uh, but it's our position that the, the adjustments made really haven't moved us dramatically. So we're still somewhere, we may not be 50th anymore, but we're still hovering somewhere around the bottom on principal pay. So what happened with the pay scale in 2017? We went from a model that valued experience to a performance pay model that relies heavily on test scores. And you see here that it introduced a $15,000 yearly bonus meant to entice principals to raise test scores. It's our view that principals are not receiving the resources that they need to do this successfully, especially in our low wealth districts. And finally, I want to, to read you what the WestEd report specifically says, a quote from the report about the new pay, principal pay scale. Quote, the compensation system creates a disincentive for effective principals to work in underperforming schools, which often take more than one year to improve and meet or exceed targets for growth. And and then then I can't resist making a comment there because what we you know when we have uh, when we see so why don't that, you go back one so we stay on that so let topic. me do that and I, I'll, okay. I'll 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 make my point as quick as I yeah. can I apologize but no. I think what's really important here is that why why is that true it's it's because what we know is that the uh, lo low performing schools are unfortunately um, correlated very closely to high poverty schools and where children are having to deal with the uh, barriers and stress and the consequences of living in in poverty uh, being um, uh, having barriers to their learning and their success in school and then these same principles are supposed to be able to take those test scores which will never be as competitive as a high performing school where poverty is not the issue and there's a lot of parental involvement and a lot of extra outside community supports. So it's just a, it's absolutely unfair to expect the principal to be in a situation where uh, it may take years to, um, uh, to achieve what you want in terms of improving your, your instruction, the quality of your instruction, as well as improving the scores of your test scores of your, of your kids. So it's, it's, it, it just makes so much uh, common sense that this is not a good idea, but they did it anyway. They did. So critical need number four, um, early childhood education. WestEd makes four recommendations here. They say to improve the pre-K teacher pipeline. And I'll just note here that we, we do not pay our pre-K pre-K teachers well at all. Um, they pretty much start at minimum wage and that really hurts us. Number two, expand and increase quality and access to Smart Start. Number three, expand North Carolina pre-K. And number four, align and improve early grade K-12 settings to promote early grade success. I'm going to explain what they mean in number four in just a second. So here's some facts about pre-K in North Carolina. We, um, our enrollment in 2019 was about 29,000 children. There is a shortage of available pre-K slots across the state. Only about half of eligible children are served. More than 50,000 children are on the wait list. The state's current North Carolina pre-K contributions, so this means the funding that the state provides is about $5,200 per child. And that, that covers, or the state covers, about 60% of the cost, leaving individual counties um, to cover the remaining 40%. Now, this is really important. In the WestEd report, they, they get specific, and they make note that some counties actually refuse the state funding because they cannot come up with the 40% balance, if you will, to cover the full cost. They said that in the um, state budget that was in 2017, 2019, so the last uh, state budget that was passed, um, they say that 44 out of 100 counties in North Carolina 
turned down or refused that state funding because they couldn't come up with the balance. 44 out of 100 counties refused the money. Um, another thing that WestEd makes note of is that both North Carolina Pre-K and Smart Start have shown, have proven, it's documented that um, they improve academic outcomes for children well into their education careers, into third grade, beyond third grade. Um, North, a strong uh, preschool program, North Carolina Pre-K and Smart Start improve graduation rates, the likelihood that a student will graduate. So these, the, the research is clear, the data is clear that these investments um, work, they're valuable, and, and we should be making these investments. And it's another example of inequity across uh, from county to county. Absolutely. That if you a county that can afford to offer children a head start, right? This whole pur the purpose of pre K Head Start, Smart Start, is to help kids come to school kindergarten ready. And so this is particularly important for children with special education needs, children um, from limited. Um, uh, homes where there's little reading happening or little reading resources and other things that engage children in educational uh, achievement. So this is another great example of inequities that doesn't have to exist. And and our position is that universal pre-K should be available. That pre-K should be available in the public school setting for every child who wants to partake. Yep. And that this should be a way to level the playing field. You will see that um, in our uh, legislative agenda that Yvonne is going to cover later in the program. So um, this is also in the WestEd report under that early childhood uh, critical need number four, and it's that um, we need to restore our teaching assistants in every K-3 classroom. About 8,000 teaching assistant positions or instructional assistant positions have been cut since 2008. Now, they were cut initially because of the recession. We all understand that. But, um, you know, we we were not in a recession. Uh, you know, I know that COVID is going to have a financial impact, but we we have had the money to invest and, and restore these teaching assistant positions, and we've not done it, and it's a failure. Uh, we advocate for restoring all of our K-3 teaching assistants in all K-3 classrooms across the state. We, the research is clear that um, having a teaching assistant in the classroom is more effective than having a small class size with one adult or one teacher. In addition, we know that this is going to help our students um, be on grade level uh, by grade three. Critical need number five um, is support for high poverty schools. They make five recommendations here. Attract, prepare, and retain highly qualified teachers and teacher mentors. Provide additional time, resources, and access to programs that support the whole child. Revise school accountability to better reflect gains. Provide more helping professionals. And provide resources and supports to address out of school barriers. So let's break down a couple of these. I'm gonna focus on um, two of those recommendations. Recommendation number three said to revise school accountability systems. That refers to North Carolina's A through F school letter grades. Our school letter grades are based on 80% test scores and 20% growth. There have been multiple bipartisan efforts to improve this formula, to change it so that growth is weighted more, and those efforts have all failed. And let me, let me say it again, multiple bipartisan efforts, all right? So, so both parties have, have tried to move this forward and improve this formula, and, and there has been no movement. We still sit at 80% test score, 20% growth. Um, these letter grades direct correlate directly with poverty levels. I think Yvonne said earlier, um, she mentioned, you know, that these high poverty schools, those are the schools that are receiving the Ds and the Fs, and the more affluent schools with students that come from middle, upper income families are receiving the As and the Bs. Um, and it, 
it, it's my understanding that if not all states even use this A through F grading system, but of the ones that do, North Carolina has the, the most flawed formula. We are the ones that use test scores most heavily of all the states that, that even bother to use them. So this is another aspect of um, the critical need number four under high poverty schools is the recommendation um, number four about helping professionals. This is something that we have advocated for for years. This is just a snapshot of where we are in North Carolina. In that first column, you see what's recommended. In the second column, you see what the state funds. And in the third column, you see um, what the averages actually are. So that third column is gonna reflect um, what counties and your local governments and your local tax dollars are gonna be able to supplement. Um, so although the state only funds 413 counselors per student, for example, some counties are able to supplement that and they provide more counselors per student. So yeah, as you see, even with county supplements, we are still not at the national recommended ratios. Critical need number six. This um, critical need, I'm actually not gonna go into detail about this one. This one is about testing and state assessments. It's pretty complicated and in the weeds, if you will. So what we've done here is I've given you the page numbers if you would like to look at this specifically in the West Ed report, you can find all this detail on pages 107 through 123 of the report, but we are actually gonna move on to critical need number seven. I make one quick comment here. Recently, uh, with the new uh, secretary for the federal level of Department of Education, has said that one of the challenges and one of the things that we need to do about accountability is untangle using accountability to help guide instruction, to help know how to improve instruction by teachers, to know how to help our kids diagnose whether whether diagnostically, where they're gaining or losing in their achievement. We need to untangle, pull that apart from the things that we do now in North Carolina, which is we punish schools. Lynn showed you A through F. We take test scores and punish schools. We take test scores and punish te teachers and principals. We want to use those to for pay for performance. So I, I was really encouraged to hear that the um, new Secretary of Education is saying, you know, assessment is great if it's used to guide instruction and to help improve um, a child's opportunity to get the education they deserve, but we've got to stop using it to punish children and teachers and principals. I thought that was a really good sign. Um, Yvonne, I'm frozen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, my video is frozen for me, but I'll just keep moving. So critical need number seven, they make uh, four recommendations here as well. Uh, rebuild uh, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, that's NCDPI, rebuild their district and school transformation division, provide resources and supports for low performing and high poverty schools to address out of school barriers, provide supports that facilitate culturally responsive curriculum, and extend supports that further MTSS, SWPBIS, and NC check-in. Well, what does all that mean? <laughs> Um, I, so MTSS is multi-tiered system of support. SWPBIS is positive behavioral interventions and supports. And NC check-ins is a DPI program. So let's break all this down just a little bit. So let me just add on the NC check-ins. That's an example of a diagnostic or formative assessment. DPI this uh, a couple years ago instituted this um, opportunity so that teachers and principals and parents would have some indication each quarter of how kids were doing. And it's all formative, is not used in a negative way against a teacher or a child or a principal or a school building. Um, and uh, it's a good example of, I was really um, glad to see that the West Ed Report was basically including this because it's an example of how you can use good information 
about student achievement without you, you know, without punishing children. So, um, okay. So under this critical need number seven, what I want the audience to understand is that DPI had been making gains at turning around low performing schools. Um, and then they faced drastic budget cuts from the General Assembly. And this really happened under two budget cycles, but again, thus we can get in the weeds in that later. Uh, Westhead points to DPI's district and school transformation model. That was a school turnaround effort that worked and had successes. It included leadership development for principals, community engagement, and supports for the whole child. It included intensive professional development for teachers. And these, these professional development opportunities took place inside these low performing schools. These teachers did not have to come to Raleigh. DPI deployed their staff and their professionals to these schools in these communities across the state to do these professional development um, workshops. And uh, this model was the most robust only for about three years between 2012 and 2015. And part of that is because of race to the top dollars. But in 2015, the General Assembly made drastic cuts to DPI there were other cuts in other years, but this cut was particularly bad at more than $5 million, and it was directed at educator support services. So that really had a, a dramatic negative impact on this model. And it's worth noting that Judge Manning, the first judge that oversaw the Leandro case, um, he ordered this type of work. So he had gotten this program in DPI uh, up and running and, and where it needed to be, um, and we are no longer in compliance uh, with his order. Critical need number eight, this is the last one, is about monitoring state compliance and progress on all of these recommendations that I've talked with you about. Judge Lee has asked for quarterly reports. We talked about that way at the beginning of the hour where the first report was due to him. Um, well, he had some due last summer um, in June of 2020, and uh, the, the governor and the State Board of Education submitted their reports. The next one was due in December of 2020, so last month. But there was an extension that was granted, and as Yvonne said, everyone agreed to that. So, you know, there's no animosity there. And we expect that the next report to be submitted in mid-February. Do you have anything else you want to add, Yvonne, about the compliance issue? No, I do think that it will be really um, important for public education advocates, child advocates, to stay uh, on top of this and to really uh, monitor what happens. I'm very concerned about this report getting delayed past February. If it does, I think we should really be ready to um, to be up in arms over it and to really lobby the school board of North Carolina and the governor's office for um, their role to get it rolling again. But no, no, I think that we just have to sit tight. So just a couple more things for me in the West Ed report. Um, I just want to make it very clear for each of the eight critical needs that we've just outlined. Um, West Ed outlines specific recommendations, because if you remember with each of my eight critical needs, I, I listed like four recommendations or six recommendations, et cetera. So they provide specific recommendations and they also provide a sequenced action plan that is divided into three phases. Those can be found on pages 140 to 153 of the report. So they lay it out for lawmakers, for advocates, they tell us exactly the steps that need to be taken. And that's outlined in the report. Oh, you skipped one. <laughs> okay, I'm back. This, this is a biggie, like every, you know, it's, it's a appropriate question. What is this all gonna cost? So WestEd estimates that it will cost about $8 billion, billion with a B, that's a lot of money over the next eight years in additional public school funding. 
And it is also appropriate for people to ask, whether you're a lawmaker or a citizen, where is that money going to come from? Where are we going to find $8 billion? And I, I just, you've seen this slide before, but Yvonne and I want to remind you about this corporate tax rate. It is our opinion that this would be a good place to start. And remember, North Carolina is an outlier with this 2.5%. It is not radical to suggest increasing it. North Carolina was at 6.9%, and that was not the highest in the United States. So even at 6.9%, I wish I had the data in front of me, that was not the highest in the United States. But we have slashed ourselves down to the bottom. And again, I, I, I'm repeating myself, our neighbors to the north and, and the south of us, they're not radical. They're at 5% corporate tax rate. I also want to make a point. Judge Lee said in September, when he had that hearing on September 1st of 2020, clearly the pandemic had started. We already saw um, state and local governments talking about the financial impact of COVID. Um, and that, that things were going to be rough moving forward. He specifically said that we cannot, we must not allow the financial impacts of the pandemic to stop us from properly, adequately funding our public education system in this state. He said those words. So we, we, need, to, we need to stick together. We need to advocate for this funding. Um, it matters and, and we need to find it. So once again, we're gonna, um, we, we're near the end of our presentation. There's a few more slides I have after this, but I wanna pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions. If you want to type it in the question block there or in the chat uh, form function, wherever you want to put it, we will be happy to, to answer it. Um, so uh, one of the questions that a lot of people are uh, asking, Lynn, is you know what's going to happen now that won't the General Assembly just use COVID as an excuse? And you mentioned, no, the judge said they can't. Doesn't mean they won't, but the judge said they can't. And they're also concerned about what impact that some of the um, virtual learning and kids not being in school and all these things might have on the urgency around Leandro. Leandro. Does that make it more urgent? Is it even more important than before. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we, we talked about this in other webinars over the last, ever since March, when we started doing our online, um, so more of these webinars. COVID has exacerbated the inequities that already existed. Um, and that that's not anything new that you and I are saying or that Public Schools First NC is saying. Many, many groups, um, you know, concerned with a variety of, of issues, understand that the inequities that existed before are only exacerbated and have had gasoline poured on them because of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, students are struggling. If we didn't need more counselors and nurses and helping professionals in our schools prior to March of 2020, we sure need more now. Um, if we didn't need more investment in high quality, well-trained uh, teachers and teacher mentoring programs, we certainly need them now. So I, you know, I think it is um, critical that we education advocates, we, we follow in Judge Lee's footsteps as far as his, what he said is that we cannot allow the devastation, financial devastation of COVID further impact these children who've already been impacted. And so then your comment leads directly to our last little segment. We're going to talk a little bit about um, your, your voice matters. What can you do? Well, it is going to matter. There is a sense of urgency that I feel more than ever before. Lynn has told you this really kind of a horror story of decades of uh, that we've not been able to address these issues. And these are kids by now who have started kindergarten, graduated, and and are in their 20s, right? I mean, we have already watched decades, several cohorts of kids 
um, go through elementary through high school or middle through high or high to, to career in, in college without the benefit of the best education they could have and, and without receiving their constitutional rights. So it is important. And so we're going to just kind of quickly say a few things. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot and um, Lynn does too, is that we're really big fans. Uh, when we got involved in advocacy work at the state level, we realized right away that the North Carolina legislative website, ncleg.net, that this website was a critical resource for all the information that we need. So I'm going to really encourage you that if you are interested in this work and you want to join us in it and either uh, in our organization or as an individual or with your PTA or your church or your civic group or your family, the first place to start is to really make sure when the General Assembly is starting back now, go to that website and familiarize yourself with some of the, the things there. We follow education committees um, now more than ever. There are lots of videos or uh, audio streams that you can listen into meetings. There's nothing more um, enlightening um, then listen to some of these folks make um, make uh, laws. Uh, it's kind of like uh, someone said, it's not very pleasant to watch sausage being made. And sometimes the most enlightening thing you can do is really listen to some of the comments that are made by different legislators. And it also helps you figure out how to advocate. Um, it's important that you know your legislators. Um, people think it may not matter. We do believe it matters. We have seen um, the needle move. We've seen um, bills not be as bad as they could be and some bills get stalled and some bills get passed because of the interaction that citizens have had with legislators. It's not in, it's important not to just know who they are but to let them know how you feel and to track and follow bills that you are concerned about that you think will have a negative impact on children, your child, your neighborhood's children, um, your, you know, the children in our state. So we're, we're very big on that. Um, and one of the things that quickly, we won't read over this, but like Lynn said, but these are the committees that we follow. We may pay particular attention to the preparation committees because we want to know and we'll be letting you know um, what is being put in the bill to propose to fund for education. We follow the Education House Committee. We follow the Educate Oversight Committee. Uh, these are committees that are critically important in terms of what's going to happen in our schools, our kids, and their funding. Um, so we'll be following those. And on that website, I just want to bring to your attention my favorite page. Um, I talk about it all the time. I think Lynn's tired of it. But when you go on the website, there's a tab at the very top, and it says Bills and Laws tab on the home page of the General Assembly. When you click on that and go into that page, it is just full of everything you need to know. There's a way to search for bills. You can put in the name of a bill. You can put in the bill number if you know it. You can put in just the content, uh, teaching assistance, and you will get it. And you can also see the votes on bill. Why is that important? Because when I'm talking to my legislator, I want to go in there and see how they've been voting on the bills. So I want to see how they voted on the appropriations bill last time, if they're, if they're, if they're experienced legislators. And I want to see also there's a glossary. Lynn and I learned pretty quick when we first started this work of ours over a decade ago that we didn't know what some of these terms meant. What did it mean when it was ratified? What did it mean when it was a resolution sent back to the House? What did, you know, so we had to go to that glossary and start learning a lot. And then there's one button there that you'll like, which is actions by the day. If you don't have time to search or look around, just go to that action by the day and you can also get it for the week and just kind of look through the titles of the bills and make sure that you see something. Now, if you don't have the time to do that, guess what? You're in good luck. We do. That's our job. So you can also follow us at Public Schools First NC, go to our website, and later we'll show you some of our other um, handles. But um, we do a legislative update now that the General Assembly is coming back into session. We'll be doing that weekly, and there'll be sometimes we'll be we'll have a document that's on our website that has all the bills for the week and what happened. We'll have things on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So really, um, if you don't have a lot of time, let us help you, please. Um, we also try to pay attention to other advocacy groups and some of their legislative updates. So maybe sometimes we miss something. Well, our buddies don't. In between the co the coalition that we have working with other 
public education and child advocacy groups, um, we're, we're pretty knowledgeable. Uh, and if we don't know the answer, we will find it. Um, Lynn's a bulldog when it comes to searching for information. And so if you ask us a question or send us an email, we will do our very best to connect you with the information or find someone who can help you. Um, the, you know, I won't go into detail because of the time and in, in the evening, but our legislative agenda, that's where we are hooking in. I want you to kind of know these are the kind of things that we care deeply about, and they are deeply embedded in the Leandro report. And I am proud to say that these are things that we've been working on for over a decade. We've been working for high quality pre-K. We have been one of the leading voices in pushing for helping professionals and our work with resilience. And uh, if you haven't seen the film Resilience, we're showing it next week. Go to our Facebook page and log in and uh, sign up. You have to register. Uh, and so uh, we care deeply about in, uh, having integrated schools. That's very important to us. And we work very hard around the issue of privatization. What is that? That is we want public tax dollars to stay in public schools. And we, um, so that's something that we care about. And we've always been on the side of paying our professionals the incomes they deserve. And if we don't do that, we're going to you know, worsen the pipeline that Lynn's already talked to you about. So just quickly, I'm not going to go into all of these except to say, yes, we want legislation that um, implements universal child care pre-k for all eligible um, kids we care deeply about having more nurses more school psychologists more social workers in our schools and we want them to be there not only to provide direct services to kids and to connect families to services in the community but we want them there to provide trauma-informed training um, to our school staff and our administrators when we see some of the issues that are going on with sros in our school system we know that these are schools that really need to be trauma informed on how they interact uh, with children and understanding is how children react to discipline and, and other issues in school. So um, we cannot say enough about this issue of special education funding. The funding for special education in North Carolina and in, in our country is woefully underfunded. We actually have highlighted these two or three things tonight because we understand from the um, national advocates and lobbyists that they really believe that pre-K, um, having more help and professionals in our schools and special education are three areas that the federal government is going to show particular attention to this year. That will help us, because Lynn showed you only 6% of our funding comes from feds. So getting an increase in our special education funding or pre-K money would be critically important um, to our state in North, uh, North Carolina. Um, the, uh, um, again, we believe strongly that there should be a moratorium on uh, vouchers. We do not support vouchers in our schools. We think that charter schools have unfairly siphoned away kids from the public school setting and disrupted their funding streams. So you can read more about that on our website. So, and then Lynn, the last thing I'll say again, that we're gonna work on again this year, as we have in the past 10 years or more, is that we believe that we've got to do something to restore the teacher pipeline. We've had over a 30% drop in the number of college students who register to be school teachers who sign up for the education certificate. This is not gonna keep working. And we've seen during COVID, Lynn mentioned that impact. One of the impacts of COVID has been more teachers retiring early or leaving the teaching profession altogether. And we were already in a fairly significant place. The last slide, I know you're happy to hear me say that. The last slide um, is a snapshot here of our YouTube channel. I want to encourage you, if you can, to go to, to YouTube and search for our YouTube channel, because on there you'll find a lot of um, videos. But one particularly I'd like you to look for is the Public Schools First Legislative Long Session. It's can not you go back? Can you go back one, Yvonne? Go back mm. again. Went pretty fast, didn't I? Um, so there it is, and there's a lot of really great videos there. 
uh, uh, webinars that we've done all during the fall and summer, um, most of last year. But there's this is where you'll find the webinar that Lynn and I did a couple weeks ago called Legislative Update on what to expect in the lawn session. What and I really just want to I want to tell people do the reason we circled videos is because if you look us up on YouTube, it's going to land you on the home page, and that's fine and that is great. We want you to see that too. But if you click videos, you see a lot more content, and so that's why we've got that videos tab circled. Um, and this is an old screenshot. There's tons more there now, um, but just be sure when you find us on YouTube to click on videos. Thank you, Lynn. And um, so now we're at the end, but I do want to give you one more chance before we hang up to see if anybody has any additional comments or questions or anything they'd like to add. Um, if you did participate in the webinar tonight, you'll get a follow-up email probably tomorrow, giving you a link to the recording. If you'd like to share that with your friends, I'd appreciate it. And again, if you have any questions for us or is there anything we can do to help you in the future, um, you know, you can reach Lynn at Lynn at publicschoolsfirst.org, Yvonne at publicschoolsfirstnc.org. Uh, our contact information is also on our Facebook, uh, our home website. Uh, we're very proud of our Facebook uh, postings, which are, you know, numerous during the day, but every time there's breaking news about education, you can find that there. So please like us and share our page with your friends. So, you know, in closing, um, I'll say, you know, the drill, like us, follow us, tweet us, uh, go to Instagram, whatever is your choice of social media. We hope that will be a part of your interest in um, what we're doing in public education. Lynn, thank you for a great presentation. We should, we should mention um, we are part of a statewide coalition exclusively devoted to the Leandro case. And that is called Every Child in C. Thank you. And I know you you all met um, this morning. Um, did you want to say anything? I wish we had a slide, but that's my fault. I forgot to put that in here. No, we don't. I don't need them. But Lynn, I appreciate you mentioning that. But if you will go to everychild.org, that's the website. And that's where we've tried to kind of stuff everything about Leandro there. Um, we do each each organization that works with every child has their own presentations like we do, uh, do their own outreach and their public education, their advocacy work. But this year we are going to uh, try to bring the power of all of us together, uh, you know, um, when we and and use it to advocate very strongly and very assertively in the general assembly. This cannot wait. The last word I'll say is that we cannot go another year, another decade. We're in another decade. We cannot do that to our kids and to the quality of life of um, of all of our uh, citizens. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, so it's been 25 years. Let's not make it 30. Um, and I I want to tell our viewers, you know. I, I believe, I don't care what court or what judge says to our lawmakers, I think it is going to come down to public pressure. Right. And if, if the public, if North Carolinians demand that our children all across this state receive a sound, basic education, lawmakers have to listen to us. So yes we need the courts yes we need these judges orders but we i implore you we need your support we need your voices our students need you it's going to take public pressure well said well said lynn and i think that'll be i'll let you have the closing word good night to everybody happy new year we'll see you at the general assembly we hope to see you um Again, on Facebook and on Twitter. In the meantime, don't forget to let us know if there's something that you need help with or some information we can provide to make your advocacy work better. Uh, if you'd like any presentation to your PTA, your civic organization, uh, we're just literally a virtual go-to meeting away. So just email Lynn and let her know and we'll try to schedule your organization. So thanks. Good night. Good night, everybody.